We're really uh, very honored to have um, Mohsen Hamid with us this evening. You know, Mohsen is, is now in his, um, his mid-40s, and I'd venture to say that, that one of the, the takeaways from his life so far is that uh, if you go to Princeton and Harvard Law School and seem on track to uh, becoming a successful uh, corporate lawyer or a management consultant, but still have an unshakable uh, hankering to be a writer, then for God's sake, become a writer. <laughs> Especially if you've had the good fortune in college to study under Joyce Carol Oates and Toni Morrison and can draw on a life lived in Lahore, London, New York, and California. Amosin's first novel, Moth Smoke, 17 years ago, signaled a pioneering voice in a new generation of writers. His second, uh, seven years later, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, marked him as an award-winning best-selling novelist, and still a very original one, unafraid to experiment. Two works that followed, uh, including his third novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, and a collection of essays, Discontent and Its Civilizations, reinforced his reputation as gifted and inventive. Uh, and judging by the enthusiastic reception given so far to e Exit West, Mohsen's fans will be pleased with his latest novel as well. It's a story of two people falling in love, set against a world falling apart in a wash with refugees. The two lovers become migrants, leaving their unidentified country in the midst of a civil war, and traveling to Greece, England, and eventually the United States in an effort to invent new lives for themselves. And if that sounds like a timely reflection of today, it's meant to be, but the book does much more than simply mirror the perilous chaos and personal costs resulting from global displacements. It rises to the level of remarkable art through Mohsen's mixing of the real and the surreal, along with his deep grasp of immigrant experiences and characteristically elegant prose. As a reviewer in The Atlantic wrote, quote, what makes Exit West so striking is the ways in which it maps the breakdown of a society and how effortlessly the cycle begins to repeat itself, even when Sayed and Nadia, uh, those are the two lovers, I think they've made it to safety. Exit West, the review went on, is a remarkable accomplishment, not putting a human face on refugees so much as putting a refugee face on all of humankind. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mohsen Hamid. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. This is, um, uh, most of you in the audience are friends and relatives of mine. I think three or four, <laughs> three or four of you are new and so we'll meet afterwards, I'm sure. Um, uh, uh, politics and prose is, is, is sort of my home in D.C. I, I've been coming here now for uh, almost as long as I've been writing fiction, and um, it's always uh, wonderful to be here. It's a really very special place. I often tell a story about something that happened to me when The Rotten Fundamentalist was published here, um, but uh, we'll see if that story comes up. Uh, it's, it's, one, it's one of these, uh, it was an interesting moment where I sort of discovered what my book was about because of a conversation with a reader here um, who said something very simple uh, and made me realize something that I hadn't yet realized but was entirely true. Uh, maybe that'll happen again tonight. But uh, I, I thought I'd just begin by, um, by reading to you uh, a little bit from the beginning and talking a little bit about what happens in the book and then reading and talking for maybe half an hour and then opening it up to your questions. Um, I'll just read from the beginning. This is the beginning of Exit West. <coughs> In a city swollen by refugees but still mostly at peace, or at least not yet openly at war, a young man met a young woman in a classroom and did not speak to her for many days. His name was Said and her name was Nadia and he had a beard. Not a full beard, more a studiously maintained stubble. And she was always clad from the tips of her toes to the bottom of her jugular notch in a flowing black robe. Back then, people continued to enjoy the wearing, the luxury of wearing more or less what they wanted to wear, clothing and hair-wise, within certain bounds, of course. And so these choices meant something. 
It might seem odd that in cities teetering at the edge of the abyss, young people still go to class. In this case, an evening class on corporate identity and product branding. But that is the way of things, with cities as with life. For one moment, we are pottering about our errands as usual, and the next we are dying. And our, imp and our eternally impending ending does not put a stop to our transient beginnings and middles until the instant when it does. Said noticed that Nadia had a beauty mark on her neck, a tawny oval that sometimes, rarely but not never, moved with her pulse. Not long after noticing this, Said spoke to Nadia for the first time. Their city had yet to experience any major fighting, just some shootings and the odd car bombing, felt in one's chest cavity as a subsonic vibration like those emitted by large loudspeakers at music concerts. And Said and Nadia had packed up their books and were leaving class. In the stairwell, he turned to her and said, Listen, would you like to have a coffee? And after a brief pause added to make it seem less forward, given her conservative attire, in the cafeteria. <laughs> Nadia looked him in the eye. You don't say your evening prayers? She asked. Said conjured up his most endearing grin. Not always, sadly. Her expression did not change. So he persevered, clinging to his grin with the mounting desperation of a doomed rock climber. I think it's personal. Each of us has his own way, or her own way. Nobody's perfect, and in any case, she interrupted him. I don't pray, she said. <laughs> she continued to gaze at him steadily. Then she said, maybe another time. He watched as she walked out to the student parking area, and there, instead of covering her head with a black cloth, as he expected, she donned a black motorcycle helmet that had been locked to a scuffed-up 100-cc trail bike, snapped down the visor, straddled her ride, and rode off, disappearing with a controlled rumble into the gathering dusk. And that's how they meet. And, you know, uh, Sayyid and Nadia are two quite different people. Uh, he works for a small advertising firm. She works for an insurance company. Uh, uh, he is very attached to his family, to his parents. He lives at home with them. Uh, she has left her family and has moved out on her own, which is unusual for young unmarried women in the city where she lives. Um, he has an attitude towards spirituality, which is um, uh, he thinks of, of his religious practice as a spiritual practice, and it's meaningful to him in his daily life. She's not particularly religious. And, um, and so these two slightly mismatched people meet each other in a city where things begin to fall apart. And uh, <coughs> in a way, the idea for the city or the starting point of the city, um, for me, the template for that city was the city of Lahore, where I live. But, uh, but the circumstances that, uh, that, that occur in the city are, fortunately, thank goodness, um, not the circumstances of Lahore, but are more like the circumstances that have befallen Aleppo or Mosul, where extremists have come in and uh, violence has increased and a civil war has begun. And, and the basic elements of, of modern contemporary life start to fall away. So say that Nadia go on their first date to a Chinese restaurant, they communicate by phone, they're, you know, WhatsApping and Facebooking and, uh, you know, Instagramming or whatever, social mediaing each other. Um, they, uh, uh, he has a car and she has a motorcycle and um, they dabble in uh, marijuana and the occasional hallucinogen. And, uh, you know, typical, you know, life in the big city. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> And yet this modernity, because increasingly the large cities of the world, modern life is becoming more similar in those cities. Lahore, if I'd come to D.C. 40 or 50 years ago, I would have thought, my goodness, D.C. is so advanced, and Lahore, you know, they're just from different planets. But today, uh, it's not, the gap is not quite so big. Um, Lahore also has wonderful bookshops like this one. Lahore also has art galleries and uh, advertising firms and insurance companies and mobile phone networks and uh, drug dealers and, you know, um, parties and uh, Chinese restaurants and uh, tall buildings and a public transport system, uh, fiber optic internet. Um, so there's been a kind of convergence of modernity in the big cities of the world. And yet that veneer is very thin and it can start to uh, be stripped away very easily. And I think part of the anxiety many people in America feel at this moment is the sudden realization of, of how thin the veneer of, of you know, civilized discourse and civilized behavior really is. Um, it's thin everywhere. But in, in their city, the events that begin to unfold are, are uh, increasingly catastrophic. And they have to make a decision whether they're going to stay or leave. 
Um, fortunately or unfortunately for them, uh, uh, the world they live in is a lot like the world that we all live in, with one slight difference. Um, they begin to appear these doors, uh, rectangular black doors. So that door over there overnight could become one of these doors. And when you step through that door, you emerge in some place far away. You could step through a door in Washington and emerge in uh, Buenos Aires. You could step through a door in Lahore and emerge in Sydney. And, um, and first a trickle and then a gush and eventually a, 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 a massive wave of people uh, passes through these doors. And the novel is, is sort of a novel about um, uh, the, the migration apocalypse, you know, where, where uh, everybody moves. Um, and yet it's an investigation of, you know, if that were to happen, perhaps it wouldn't be all that apocalyptic at all. Um, I do think the next two or three hundred years, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of people will move. They always have, historically looking back. 500 years ago, there were nobody of European uh, ancestry living in North America. Um, and now look at what North America looks like today. 500 years hence, things will be as different from now as they now is from 500 years ago. Um, but in this novel, that, that change is compressed. And, and one of the reasons for that is I think um, it's very important for us to begin to imagine uh, these futures. Um, that if we, if we don't start to imagine these futures and begin to form out of our imagination of these futures uh, potentially desirable, hopeful, optimistic visions, um, then what we're left with is a, is a turning away from the future. And that manifests itself in, a, in a, a nostalgic political impulse. And that nostalgic political impulse expresses itself as, um, you know, let's, make, uh, let's take ourselves back to the caliphate of a thousand years ago. Or let's take ourselves back to Britain uh, before it joined the EU. Or let's take us back to America of the 1950s. Um, and these projects of restoration, these sort of nostalgic political projects, are, are very dangerous because you can't go back in time. Um, and, and also because the imaginary better time is in fact imaginary. It perhaps was not better at all. Uh, and going there is likely to be much worse. So um, that's the backdrop for all of this. I thought I'd read a little bit more just to show you sort of what it's like to pass through a door, um, because they do. And, uh, and this is just um, the experience they have of going through a door. And one thing I'll say uh, before I read this passage out is, <coughs> is so often we think of people who are migrants or refugees as, you know, having come for a better life and it's, it's this, you know, uh, they haven't paid their dues and here they are taking advantage of our society. Uh, so often we forget um, the enormous crushing pain that is involved in leaving your homeland. You know, you will never see your parents again, perhaps. Uh, your family will be scattered. Uh, your friends will never get together in one place. Um, you know, you, uh, uh, you won't walk down these streets, eat this food, hear this music. Uh, there's an enormous pain to that story. And particularly in America, it's worth reminding ourselves of this because the story of America is really two stories. It's the, you know, the migration story of America. It's the one we hear all the time of setting forth on this journey full of optimism to invent something new. But America has always had difficulty mourning properly. The, the instinct uh, to accept sorrow is always one that America has, I think, politically shied away from. And the other part of the American story is, think of the sadness. In some ways, America is the saddest country that there's ever been, because almost everybody who's come here is left behind these people. And that sorrow is also part of the American story. And it's part of the story of these migrants as well. Um, and the doors, in a way, allowed me to focus on, on the sorrow of the departure, uh, and also the radical change that happens in a new place. Um, while not having to spend too much time on how we get from place to place. Because so often we think of migrants and we think of refugees and we think, um, how did they cross the Rio Grande? And how did they cross uh, this, the Mediterranean in this rubber boat overloaded and it capsized, people drowned? So different from me. But that's a tiny little moment in the lifetime of a human being. It might be traumatic, horrific, um, uh, tragic, but it's very small. Most of the story is, what made you leave? What did it feel like to leave? And what became of you when you arrived? And so the doors, in a way, allows this story to focus on those two elements and not on the element of the journey, which is so often what we do focus on, which makes the migrant different from us because we didn't have that journey. So this is what it's like to pass through the door. It was said in those days that the passage was both like dying and like being born. And indeed, Nadia experienced a kind of extinguishing as she entered the blackness and a gasping struggle 
as she fought to exit it, and she felt cold and bruised and damp as she lay on the floor of the room at the other side, trembling and too spent at first to stand. And she thought, while she strained to fill her lungs, that this dampness must be her own sweat. Said was emerging and Nadia crawled forward to give him space, and as she did so, she noticed the sinks and mirrors for the first time, the tiles of the floor, the stalls behind her, all the doors of which, save one, were normal doors, all but the one through which she had come, and through which Said was now coming, which was black, and she understood that she was in the bathroom of some public place, and she listened intently, but it was silent, the only noises emanating from her, from her breathing, and from Said his quiet grunts like those of a man exercising or having sex. They embraced without, without getting to their feet, and she cradled him, for he was still weak, and when they were strong enough, they rose, and she saw Said pivot back to the door, as though he wished maybe to reverse course and return through it. And she stood beside him without speaking, and he was motionless for a while. But then he strode forward, and they made their way outside and found themselves between two low buildings perceiving a sound like a shell held to their ears and feeling a cold breeze on their faces and smelling brine in the air and they looked and saw a stretch of sand and low gray waves coming in and it seemed miraculous although it was not a miracle they were merely on a beach and in this way say the Nadia arrive in, in in Greece on an island in Greece uh, which is which is now full of refugees and migrants from all over the world um, and from there they go to London, and from there they wind up in Marin County, California. Um, and in, in a weird way, this novel is sort of uh, uh, geographically autobiographical. Um, uh, I mean, I, I have this is not the story of my life, um, obviously, uh, but um, but I too have a life that is composed of sort of Lahore and uh, California and America and London and. Um, and so the places that make up this novel are places that have, uh, that have in many cases, been home to me, or at least places I've been to. Um, and, uh, and as they're moving, other people are moving. And very often in the novel, we're encountering these other people and seeing them move. And, um, and what we discover is that, uh, 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 that really everyone is a migrant. That... Um, Say the Nadia, of course, are migrants, and people who move from place to place are migrants. But uh, but everybody's experiencing this world of migration, and in a sense, the the novel, um, the, uh, the position in the novel is 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 that um, is not to privilege the view of the person who arrives. There are the people who are there. There are people who are frightened of the arrival. There are people who are maybe finding opportunity in the arrival. There are all sorts of people, and and in a way, we're all in this together. Um, but let me read to you one small passage, because in the novel we, we alight upon the stories, little vignettes of people in different places. And this is a little vignette about an old lady in Palo Alto. Um, and uh, uh, it's about sort of the universality of migration. And, and it's, uh, it's, it occurs when they've moved to Marin County, say the Nadia. Uh, they're living in this giant shanty town uh, on the hills of Marin, uh, overlooking San Francisco, you know, like a, like a, Brazil, like a Brazilian you know, favela. And... Um, and, uh, and a couple hours south is this lady living in Palo Alto who's, who's lived in the same place. And here's what she feels. Not far to the south in the town of Palo Alto lived an old woman who had lived in the same house her entire life. Her parents had brought her to this house when she was born. And her mother had passed on there when she was a teenager. And her father when she was in her 20s. And her husband had joined her there. And her two children had grown up in this house, and she had lived alone with them when she divorced, and later with her second husband, their stepfather, and her children had moved off to college and not returned, and her second husband had died two years ago, and throughout this time she had never moved, traveled, yes, but never moved, and yet it seemed the world had moved, and she barely recognized the town that existed outside her property. The old woman had become a rich woman on paper, the house now worth a fortune, and her children were always pestering her to sell it, saying they didn't need all that space. But she told them to be patient. It would be theirs when she died, which wouldn't be long now. And she said this kindly, to sharpen the bite of it, and to remind them how much they were motivated by money, money they spent without having, which she had never done, always saving for a rainy day, even if only a little. One of her granddaughters went to the great university nearby, a university that had gone from being a local secret 
to among the world's most famous in the space of the old woman's lifetime. This granddaughter came to see her, often as much as once a week. She was the only one of the old woman's descendants who did this, and the old woman adored her, and also sometimes felt baffled by her. Looking at her granddaughter, she thought she saw what she would have looked like had she been born in China. For the granddaughter had features of the old woman, and yet looked to the old woman overall, more or less, but mostly more, Chinese. There was a rise that led, that led up to the old woman's street, and when she was a little girl, the old woman used to push her bike up and then get on and zoom back down without pedaling, bikes being heavy in those days and hard to take uphill, especially when you were small, as she was then, and your bike too big, as hers had been. She had liked to see how far she could glide without stopping, flashing through the intersections, ready to brake, but not overly ready, because there had been a lot less traffic, at least as far as she could remember. She had always had carp in a mossy pond in the back of her house, carp that her granddaughter called goldfish, and she had known the names of almost everyone on her street, and most of them had been there a long time. They were old California, from families that were California families, but over the years they had changed more and more rapidly, and now she knew none of them, and saw no reason to make the effort, for people bought and sold houses the way they bought and sold stocks, and every year someone was moving out and someone was moving in, and now all these doors from who knows where were opening, and all sorts of strange people were around, people who looked more at home than she was, even the homeless ones who spoke no English, more at home maybe because they were younger. And when she went out, it seemed to her that she too had migrated, that everyone migrates, even if we stay in the same houses our whole lives, because we can't help it. We are all migrants through time. And, and so what's happening in this novel is in a way an exploration of, of migration and, and sort of the universality of migration and, and a way of thinking, um, you know, instead of imagining ourselves as natives and migrants, uh, it might well be that, that it's more useful to imagine us all experiencing migration. Um, and even people who, um, who are opposed to migration, in a way, uh, uh, they are people who are resisting sort of the migration of the environment around them in their own lives. Um, it's something that we're all intimately involved in. And, and there are many ways, of course, of dealing with that. There's love and there's family and there's you know, many other techniques that we've seen developed by humanity since the beginning of, of, of you know, human history. Um, and as I've said before, Nadia is not religious, but, but for Sayyid, religion does play an element in that. And I thought I'd just close by, by reading to you a little bit about... Um, about uh, uh, religion in Sayyid's life. Um, because I think in a way it's important uh, to not shy away from questions that have been historically in the religious domain. That it, 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 um, It's important to find common ways of speaking of things um, that aren't unique to any one religious tradition and don't necessarily require belief in a religious tradition, um, but address sort of human concerns and feelings that some people address in religious fashion and others don't, uh, but, that, uh, but that all of us feel. And so this is a, a little observation of, of religion in Sayyid's life, and it's the last thing I'll read, and then we can uh, perhaps move into uh, some questions and answers. How much time do we have? Let me see before I decide how much to read. Oh, we're okay. All right. <coughs> When Sayyid was a child, he first prayed out of curiosity. He had seen his mother and father praying, and the act held a certain mystery for him. His mother used to pray in her bedroom, perhaps once a day, unless it was a particularly holy time, or there had been a death in the family, or an illness, in which case she prayed more often. His father prayed mainly on Fridays under normal circumstances, and only sporadically during the week. Sayyid would see them preparing to pray and see them praying, and see their faces after they had prayed, usually smiling, as though relieved or released or comforted, and he would wonder what happened when one prayed. And he was curious to experience it for himself, and so he had asked to learn before his parents had yet thought of teaching him. And his mother provided the requisite instruction one particularly hot summer, and that is how, for him, it began. Until the end of his days, prayer sometimes reminded Sayyid of his mother and his parents' bedroom with its slight smell of perfume and the ceiling fan churning in the heat. As he was entering his teens, Sayyid's fa father asked Sayyid if he would like to accompany him to the weekly communal prayer. 
Said said yes, and thereafter every Friday, without fail, Said's father would drive home and collect his son, and Said would pray with his father and the men. And prayer for him became about being a man, being one of the men, a ritual that connected him to adulthood and to the notion of being a particular sort of man, a gentleman, a gentle man. A man who stood for community and faith and kindness and decency. A man, in other words, like his father. Young men pray for different things, of course, but some young men pray to honor the goodness of the men who raised them. And Said was very much a young man of this mold. By the time he entered university, Said's parents prayed more often than they had when he was younger. Maybe because they had lost a great many loved ones by that age, or maybe because the transient natures of their own lives were gradually becoming less hidden from them or maybe because they worried for their son in a country that seemed to worship money above all, no matter how much other forms of worship were given lip service, or maybe simply because their personal relationships with prayer had deepened and become more meaningful over the years. Said too prayed more often in this period, at the very least once a day, and he valued the discipline of it, the fact that it was a code, a promise he had made, and that he stood by. Now though, in Marin, Said prayed even more, several times a day, and he prayed fundamentally as a gesture of love for what had gone and would go and could be loved in no other way. When he prayed, he touched his parents, who could not otherwise be touched. And he touched a feeling that we are all children who lose our parents, all of us, every man and woman and boy and girl. And we too will all be lost by those who come after us and love us. And this loss unites humanity, unites every human being, the temporary nature of our beingness and our shared sorrow, the heartache we each carry and yet too often refuse to acknowledge in one another. And out of this, Said felt it might be possible, in the face of death, to believe in humanity's potential for building a better world. And so he prayed as a lament, as a consolation, and as a hope. But he felt that he could not express this to Nadia, that he did not know how to express this to Nadia, this mystery that prayer linked him to and it was so important to express it. And somehow, he was able to express it to the preacher's daughter, the first time they had a proper conversation at a small ceremony he happened upon after work, which turned out to be a remembrance for her mother, who had been from Said's country, and was prayed for communally on each anniversary of her death. And her daughter, who was also the preacher's daughter, said to Said, who was standing near her, so tell me about my mother's country. And when Said spoke, he did not mean to, but he spoke of his own mother, and he spoke for a long time, and the preacher's daughter spoke for a long time. And when they finished speaking, it was already late at night. Thank you. If anybody likes any questions, please uh, come to the microphone. So thank you. Please. Um, in your uh, introductory remarks, you referred to um, civilized discourse and maybe uh, civilized behavior. Uh, but in your <coughs> uh, introduction to your book of essays, um, you say civilizations are illusions, but these illusions are pervasive, dangerous, and powerful. You explain uh, what you mean by civilizations uh, in the paragraph before, uh, Muslimness, Westernness, Europeanness, Americanness. Uh, but would you elaborate on this um, paradox uh, between um, uh, the danger of civilization and the concept of uh, civilized be behavior? It, it, it's not a paradox. What, what, what I find, um, it's a very good question. Um, uh, what I object to is the notion of civilizations plural. Um, the idea that there are, you know, there is a Western civilization and a, you know, Muslim civilization and a Pakistani civilization. And, um, uh, I believe that there's a human civilization. So my my disagreement is with the notion of of multiple civilizations, each discrete with its own members, um, competing with other civilizations, you know, discrete with its own members. Uh, that, to me, is, a, is something that has to be uh, uh, questioned and interrogated. But humanity collectively partaking together 
of one shared human civilization, I think is something different. Uh, in other words, it is the sum total of what we all together participate in. Um, the other civilizations, I think, are arbitrary in terms of their boundaries and how they exclude and who they include, etc. So I think it's possible to speak of, of civilized ways of behavior based on tolerance, honesty, and these sorts of uh, uh, values. Um, but, uh, but I would distinguish that from the civilizations in that book, which I say are illusory, because um, it's like saying, for example, uh, I believe in human beings. I don't particularly believe in races. Um, you know, uh, uh, I believe in, you know, the people of planet Earth, but I don't particularly believe that the concept of America or the concept of Pakistan, for example, um, are entirely real. Uh, uh, I think that they are these sort of things that we've made up. So, so I'm much more comfortable with a term uh, of, of, uh, of tolerant behavior that encompasses everyone and much more uncomfortable with the idea of these subgroupings that, that divide them. Um, I hope that begins to answer your question, but I'm happy to discuss it more afterwards if you like. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, this is a, s a follow up to that question. Is, in that respect, is your book um, a sort of anti Aeneid? Wow. Um, uh, <laughs> Now, I, I, can, I can do this in one of two ways. I can uh, bluff my way into sort of claiming I know more about the Aeneid than I do, or, or um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, um, well. <laughs> I think that, I think that, um, that one thing which has happened, you know, historically is um, technology has collapsed distance. So, the ability for different groups to exist in separate worlds and occasionally clash with each other, um, that's being changed. Um, uh, now we are always engaged and as individuals always in a sense clashing um, and as groups even, you know, clashing. Um, I, I think that it is therefore very important to begin to imagine some new starting points for this globalized world. Technology has made it impossible for us to be separate. Um, I can open my phone right now and you know, see my kids in Pakistan. Uh, I can step onto an airplane and be there within a day. And you know, somebody living in Lahore can watch the Real Housewives of the OC. You know, uh, this is all happening now simultaneously. It, you know, you can be in one place seeing something else. The peasants of France couldn't see, you know, the king of France sort of living in his palace and, and eating all these wonderful things. Uh, but the peasants of planet Earth um, can go into the homes of some of the richest people uh, and watch what they're up to. And some of the richest people can, in fact, watch the homes of some of the poorest people, and they can watch it from documentary perspective, they can watch it from the perspective of the targeting apparatus of a military uh, unmanned flying aircraft. You know, it, this, this, this is creating a new sort of situation. Now, um, and so I think that we have to begin to use our imaginations to conceive of how we're going to go forward from here. Um, and, and the things that have gotten us to this point are faltering. So what are those things? You know, one, one thing um, in, in a sense, you know, much of what we would call the Western canon, although I, I hesitate to use that term because the Western canon is entirely animated with Eastern stuff as well. You know, I mean, the, the Greeks were rediscovered by the Europeans because of the Arabs. Um, uh, you know, the airplane was invented in America, but the zero that was the basis of the mathematics that invented the airplane, you know, comes to us from India. And from, so it's, you know, physics, you know, is, is a common human uh, development. Um, similarly, democracy. Anyway, so I, I think that what's, what's happened is we've reached certain, uh, we've reached a sort of stalling position. Uh, one of those things is we've, we, for example, uh, believe in equality, and we've had this march of equality. The problem is that um, if we really believe in human equality, and we say things like, you know, we will not discriminate on the basis of your race, we will not discriminate on the basis of your gender, we will not discriminate on the basis of you know, what religion you belong to, hopefully, or um, on what you say, who you choose to love, um, how you choose to, you know. Uh, it becomes very difficult for us to say, however, the accident of the geographic location of your birth will be the basis for any imaginable discrimination. Um, 
And I suspect that, you know, in two or three centuries from now, people will look back at this historical moment and they'll be as perplexed by us and the way we treat each other differently based on where we were born as we are by people who kept slaves two centuries ago. Uh, I think this will take a lot of time because much has to change. But really, we're sort of stuck on the equality, you know, um, uh, continuum because we aren't willing to acknowledge this element of, of equality. Um, and what that means is that populists who say, hey, we don't believe people are equal, have a great deal of power because what they're saying is true. We don't actually believe people are equal. We don't, we're not willing to accept this element of equality. Um, and as long as we can say, no, our direction of travel is clear, it would be enormously disruptive for us to accept this equality today. But we think over time, gradually you know, speaking, we will evolve to the point where we're going to get to something like that. If that direction of travel becomes clear, then I think this, this critique becomes weaker. But when you reverse the direction of travel, and you say not only do we think that people who are born elsewhere are less equal, we will among ourselves start looking within our own society to determine our, our ancestral purity and determine whether we are equal. Then you're in a very dangerous position, and I think you know, much of the world, in fact, is in exactly that position. Um, so that's one crisis we face, the crisis of equality. And the other crisis I think that we face, which is a related crisis, um, has to do with, you know, we're sort of at the apotheosis of this idea that, um, you know, that we are rational consumers, self-interested consumers. Uh, I mean, that's a useful idea, but, but we are now approaching the point where it's reaching its ultimate expression. What does that ultimate expression look like? That ultimate expression looks like someone whose attention is so distracted by technologically intermediated forms of interaction, constantly buying things, constantly being stimulated, constantly being, you know, uh, um, it's a sort of technological fantasy that each individual technologist produces a product that takes a bit of our time. <laughs> but collectively, all of these products take all of our time. And we are left un completely not present in the, in the moment in which we live and utterly distracted. Um, and, and even though in theory that's what our economics and our, you know, our, uh, our the way we've constructed our model of development on um, is not making us very happy. So there's a crisis of that. And then you think, well, how are we going to begin to address all this stuff? We've got climate disasters coming. The truth is we have enormous reservoirs of wisdom, actually, all over the world, here and everywhere. And, um, and I think it's not, you know, now what we're beginning to see is people trying to excavate those reservoirs. So to give you an example, you know, one of the most, um, uh, I think, sort of incredible uh, future thinking and imaginative and human gestures of, you know, political act that one has seen in recent years was when Pope Francis, you know, washed the, the feet of a Muslim convict with his mm -hmm. bare hands. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that gesture? I mean, that gesture is shocking to us because it demonstrates a degree of, of humaneness mm -hmm. which is completely absent from most of our political discourse or our cultural uh, discourse. Where does it come from? It comes from a particular Latin American strand of liberation theology, which is now manifesting itself in the Catholic Church because demographics have led to the point where it is no longer tenable to only have popes from you know, Europe. Um, so these things will begin to happen in, in Pakistan and places like that. There are, um, there are elements of, of Sufi thought which, which basically um, are about the notion that um, if we love uh, strongly enough, we are less centered in ourselves. If we are less centered in ourselves, the eventual obliteration of ourselves is less terrifying to us. Um, you know, there are similar things in Jewish existentialism, in Martin Buber, in, in you know, Hindu uh, thinking, in, in, in Zen Buddhism, and in, in, you know, living in the moment. And uh, in the sense of if transience is what terrifies us, focus on now. Um, and so, uh, without sort of offering some kind of like new age set of reading for everybody, let's all go off and like become Zen, you know, there's a funny thing, there's a, there's a Zen Sufi um, uh, religious code in Frank Herbert's Dune, so he might have been way ahead of his time. But, but I guess what I'm saying is that, is that whatever the answers are, we have to begin to imagine the future in a way that is more human, that draws upon the collective knowledge and capabilities and understanding of the entire species, um, that is liberated from the kind of, you know, dead-end uh, tribalism uh, which, we, which we are uh, sadly gripped by today. Um, and in that sense, is sort of the opposite of, um, you know, of, of much of uh, 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 some of the uh, Greek epics which, which were about civilizational 
conflict uh, as, a, as a you know uh, uh, as a way of defining who we are. Um, I think what we actually are engaged in is civilizational you know uh, is a sort of cross pollinated human civilization. Um, and, and the fertility of that civilization, like the fertility of any natural system, will be enhanced by the additional amount of genetic code we let into it. Uh, and, so, and so the more stuff we can bring in from the more traditions um, uh, with a kind of, in the context of a relentlessly optimistic, imaginative nature, um, with equality as our principle and sort of you know, human dignity as our principle, that's for me a way forward, and that looks quite different, I think, from a lot of you know uh, uh, the writings of the Mediterranean of two thousand years ago. So this is also a follow up of the first question. Actually, uh, the follow up of the, your answer to the first question. So you don't agree with the idea of plural civilizations, West versus West, uh, East, but it's just, I, so are there any ev evolution of your thoughts? Because I remember in the fundament, uh, reluctant fundamentalist, uh, the protagonist, uh, he obviously suffered from some of the clashes, like uh, he was ill at ease when he, he went to uh, Greece with yes. his friends, and uh, also when he, I think he went to Philippines uh, with that yep. big corporate. And so perhaps I'm speaking from my personal e experience because I am also an immigrant and uh, coming from Taiwan to here. I think depending on how you look at it, you can say that you have the best of both worlds. Or you can also say, it's for me, it's like I never belong to anywhere. Yes. So. So I'm just wondering, so from the reluctant fundamentalist to, to now, like, uh, what's the change of your yeah. thinking process? No, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent question. In the reluctant fundamentalist, though, the, um, what the reluctant fundamentalist was not meant to advocate mm -hmm. Chinggis' position. So Chinggis mm -hmm. is a character mm -hmm. who feels after September 11th that he has to sort of pick sides. Mm -hmm. And he imagines these sides to be sort of an American, you know, Western side mm -hmm. and sort of a Pakistani, mm -hmm. you know, Eastern side or a Muslim side. And he feels he has to pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. And this does enormous psychic, psychological damage to him because he's been living in America and he's become somewhat Americanized. Mm -hmm. So to pick one of these things, in, fo in fact, involves him denying you know, part of himself. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes on a particular journey uh, uh, that follows that route. Um, I wasn't advocating that journey. I, and in fact, I, 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 I sort of was exploring that journey as a counterpoint to the journey that I've been on myself, which mm -hmm. is to say, look, if I'm a mongrel hybrid person, I should just be a mongrel hybrid person. It's sort of harder to say than saying, you know, I'm just this one thing, but it's more true to what I am. Um, now, to your point of the, what we personally feel is, and certainly I think all of us retain various tribal affiliations. You know, I'm a Lahori. I'm also kind of a Californian, you know, I'm a bit of a New Yorker. Um, uh, 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 I love it when the Pakistan cricket team wins. You know, it's a complex set of, uh, uh, I'm not sort of, sort of post, you know, Pakistan wins, you know, uh, China wins, India wins, it's all the same to me. But, but that said, um, I don't, I don't uh, uh, allow my impulse of feeling that I'm excited when Pakistan wins. Um, to define me as some way ex as exclusively Pakistani, and more importantly, to define others as not partaking of Pakistani qualities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think, the, for me, the big realization came as, as, a, as a, I don't know if immigrant's the right way, because immigrant assumes, it, immigrant sort of privileges the place of arrival, the term immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every immigrant is also an emigrant. Yeah. And, uh, and I have been immigrating and emigrating so many times, I'm just sort of, you know, migrant at this point. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that when I was younger, uh, when I came to California, I wanted to be like a Californian kid. And when I was a teenager in Pakistan, I wanted to just be a Pakistani kid. Nobody should know that I have this weird Californian thing and mm -hmm. should speak like everybody else. And, and in my 20s, eventually, I started to say, you know, this, is, this doesn't make sense. I should just be myself. And if that means I'm a bit weird everywhere, then, you know, so be it. Um, and, uh, and when I began to act in that way, you know, more, uh, I guess, different wherever I happened to be, mm -hmm. what I discovered was that many people who, you know, uh, many people that I assumed had um, a, a, a deeply indigenous sense, who were natives, mm -hmm. in various ways, they, they feel foreign too. 
because they might not have the same sense of foreignness maybe about what nation they come from. Mm -hmm. But they might have a foreignness within their own family between perhaps being conservative in a liberal family or perhaps being, you know, a liberal in a conservative family, perhaps being gay in a predominantly, you know, uh, a straight family or perhaps being a homophobe in a predominantly accepting of gay community. Um, you know, uh, everybody actually feels foreign. If you get to know underneath, nobody's sitting there saying, yep, I'm exactly like, you know, I'm, I'm totally comfortable. If everybody knew who I really was, things would be just very chilled out. Um, uh, and so, so oddly enough, those of us who, who, are, who are forced to grapple with our difference from everybody else are also in a position to be more empathetic to every other individual's grappling with that same thing. And they grapple with it under the tyranny of a presumed not grappling. In other words, we're supposed to be confused. They are not supposed to be confused, mm -hmm. and yet they are confused, which makes it much more difficult to deal with the confusion. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so oddly enough, I mean, I think that um, I think that being, you know, between cultures and being between, you know, uh, these uh, countries or being between what you might think of as civilizations, although it's not a term that I'm, you know, necessarily thrilled as we've discussed. Um, however, you define it, being between between the groups as you define those groups, it is true that you are. But those groups upon closer examination begin to scatter and develop into lots of little subcomponents. And other people who are not in the groups that you belong to may partake of things that are close to you. And so um, uh, I think that the, the discomfort that so many of us feel who are between places is actually a very fertile position. Um, we are already destabilized. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the terror of destabilization, which so limits many other people, is maybe less limiting to us, mm -hmm. you know? Um, we have grappled with, to a larger extent, what everybody is going to be grappling with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's why in communities in America, which have lots of immigrants, they're not so scared of immigrants, mm -hmm. right? It's the places that don't have that many recent immigrants that are scared of immigrants. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Brexit, you know? It's the places which didn't have. Mm -hmm. London is full of migrants, but nobody in London was too pushed about, I mean, the majority was not mm -hmm. too pushed about Brexit. Um, it is the communities that have grappled the least with these issues that are the most terrified by them. So, so in that sense, it may not be a great feeling to think, you know, we're sort of ahead of the curve. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but I, think, I think in a way, this sense of dislocation and the need to forge a personal identity out of the different components that make each of us up is going to become an essential human project and probably has been for a long time and hasn't been acknowledged. Thank you. Thank you. People are terrified. The answers are so long that they're so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never get out of here if I ask another question. Um, I, I promise questions? I'll just answer one more. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Oh, you got yeah. it. Okay, two more. Um, no, no? Oh, okay. I'll go. Uh, thank you so much for being here. First of all, it was really wonderful to hear from your story. Um, my question is that, of course, the refugee experience is so is different, subtle and not so subtle ways to the. I mean, immigrant experience, I mean, refugees are immigrants, but not all immigrants are refugees. So was that significant for you when you were when you were writing this book? And then how did you capture that and make sure sort of your own personal experience as a non-refugee didn't kind of clash with that or shadow that? Well, I mean, the thing about it is I, I think that the term refugee actually mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is a legal term more than anything else. In other words, in our current legal mm -hmm. uh, uh, structure, Somebody who is a refugee is somebody who's entitled to certain protections under international law. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that generally applies to people who are in very desperate situations. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the notion of, of refugee is mm -hmm. not necessarily a human concept, right? There's just different degrees of extreme yep. of migration. Mm -hmm. um, somebody may not be accepted as, as a refugee, but actually be in danger of their life. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody may be accepted as a refugee, but actually be quite comfortable where they came from. Um, uh, and so I, w I think it's very important, of course, to defend the rights of refugees mm -hmm. um, uh, because, you know, it, it's, a, it's basic human decency. The mm -hmm. same reason why if someone is drowning in a swimming pool, we believe it is our obligation mm -hmm. to dive in and help them. Or if we're too scared, at least to get somebody to dive in or to throw in something for them to catch on. We can't just say, well, they're drowning and, you know, I kind of don't really want to get wet and, mm -hmm. you know, it's very cold, you know. Mm -hmm. So long. Um, a refugee is that. Mm -hmm. It's a fellow human being who's in such a precarious situation that we have an obligation to help. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and so when we reject refugees from a legal standpoint, mm -hmm. we say, oh, we're not going to take refugees. What we're saying is we will let those people drown. Mm. And when we do that, our own humanity is completely compromised. You know, mm -hmm. how do we look ourselves in the face after we do that? And so, and so we have to resist for the simple reason that for our own you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, humanity, we can't allow this to occur. Uh, now, in terms of migrant versus refugee, uh, so if we imagine that refugees represent people who've endured really extreme circumstances leading to mm -hmm. migration, um, I haven't endured such uh, extreme circumstances. So how might you know I write about mm -hmm. this? The same way that I write about an old woman, or I write about a you know a dog, or I write about a drone, or I write about um, you know uh, a man who is mm -hmm. different from me, or anything else. I imagine being that person. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about being a human being is we can imagine being whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we are designed to do so. My children, seven and four, left to their own, will very quickly devolve into or evolve into a T-Rex, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and a sort of, you know, uh, unicorn taming, mm -hmm. taming sorceress. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, um, and, you know, that is innate to them. Nobody's yeah. telling them, you know, go play, be a T-Rex. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to be. And as they get older, their fantasies become, you know, a bit more human, hopefully. Uh, and, and then they start imagining being other people. But, you know, the thing is that actually ourselves that we cling to so tightly are yeah. at least partly illusory, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you are talking <coughs> about, you know, ancient Suvi mystics or mm -hmm. Zen masters or contemporary neuroscientists who are putting our brains into uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging machines, what we yeah. realize is how we experience reality is a construct by a biological machine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like what you see on, on the screen of your iPhone is not the iPhone. Yeah. It is what the iPhone represents, mm -hmm. uh, it, what, what it presents. Um, and similarly, this thing that we're all mm -hmm. experiencing is, is a construct, right? Mm -hmm. It is at least partly illusory. And we love fiction because we know it's partly illusory. Yeah. And we can almost easily slip into another one. Mm -hmm. And that actually is a great saving thing for our species because if we can imagine being other people, not that we can accurately, I mean, I can't accurately represent mm -hmm. you, but that's not what we judge each other by. We mm -hmm. judge each other by the emotional honesty of the attempt at portrayal. But was there any ethnographic experience where you spoke or maybe lived no, with? No, I didn't, I didn't do any research. I mean, look, I, I'll tell you. I'll <laughs> no, I mean, that's uh, a personal <laughs> choice too, and that can be important for you to capture from your imagination. It, it can be, but I, it question. can be, but, uh, but in a sense, I'm like my kids, yeah. you know, so... For me, when I think about uh, someone who uh, is losing their parents, for mm -hmm. example, I think about how I feel when I consider whether I should leave Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Every day, my children play with their parents. Mm -hmm. And I think about what would happen if I prevented that from occurring. Mm -hmm. And I feel something. And then I explore yeah. that feeling. And then I imagine, what if that feeling was permanent? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then something occurs. So yeah. that's my journey in. It. It's not really the... the it's not a... It is, um, I believe that, that the emotional register we all experience may not be the same, mm -hmm. but it is a valid way of, of entering into, into mm -hmm. each other's experience, that we shouldn't be confined to simply speaking of ourselves, to mm -hmm. only engage in nonfiction and memoir, mm -hmm. that we should be able to go beyond that. And then the test of that really is you, the reader, when you read it, mm -hmm. what does it feel like? Mm -hmm. Does it feel like this guy's an idiot and what's he doing, or, mm -hmm. does it, or does it feel like something else? And I don't know actually how it'll feel for you. And it is your, you know, it's your right to mm -hmm. feel what you feel. And, and it is, in a way, the novel's task yeah. to hopefully win you over. Yeah. And you'll have to see whether Thanks it does. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, that, that made a good segue to my question, which I'm still having trouble formulating. <laughs> um, if, uh, you know, as you, uh, as you uh, uh, recognize, and a lot of us feel the same way, that modernity across cities, across the world, uh, make the cities look more and more like each other. Uh, what do you think human beings will be like 50 years from now? We're not going to have a distinct brown skin and a distinct white skin. Uh, we're not going to have uh, an origin. We say that, you know, I'm from so-and-so country. So how do you think we're going to be? We're going to become all like clones or <laughs> well i mean you know, we're probably more likely to have brown skin than not actually in this <laughs> in, the, in the world that i'm describing but uh, uh i mean you know how will it look i don't know I mean, to be very honest yeah of course behavior, you're yeah. you're right i mean uh, um what will this future society look like um i don't know what in the book what what we what we get to sort of towards the end is this giant you know 
coming together of all sorts of people, this giant mixing. Now, let's try to imagine a country where people from lots of different places come and settle and start to speak you know, together and you know, uh, spend time together and evolve a kind of you know, uh, language and a way of interacting. And, you know, I mean, America is already a lot like that, right? Yeah. But, but um, sort of, you know, America is sort of a 1.0, you know, version of this. In the sense that, in the, sense that in, um, um, the American version of that occurred under a specific sort of racial um, uh, configuration, right? Where, where the Native Americans, who of course are not indigenous to North America either, they are the pre-Columbian Americans. They were the earliest migrants uh, to this place. Um, you know, they were largely exterminated or pushed back or whatever. Then another group of people were, uh, were imported from Africa. Um, and then they were subjected to you know, a, a type of slavery which probably has no parallel in how despicable it was in any form of slavery on planet Earth. Or maybe it does, but you know, if you imagine slavery in much of the rest of the world, you, know, the, you could buy your way out. You know, your kids, if they were born to a slave, maybe would be free or whatever. But in the American model, even if the tiniest amount of slave blood was in you, and you were my child or my grandchild, I would have to whip you, I would have to castrate you, I might have to rape you. I mean, that is, a, that is an incredible, uh, uh, incredibly horrific uh, you know, uh, basis for any kind of human interaction, which totally destroyed the humanity of, of those who were practicing the slavery. You know, forget those who were, who were, who were subjugated by it. Um, so, so this American coming together of peoples hasn't happened sort of under this perfect, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, a model. But that said, it has achieved a lot of, you know, amazing things. Um, uh, you know, it has contributed a great deal to uh, so much of how we think about, you know, how societies maybe can be more equal, um, how you can evolve increasingly towards a better and better state of affairs, um, <laughs> inclusivity, you know, technology, lots of things. Um, but surely there are better versions that we can think of as 2.0 for this that don't come encumbered with this particular kind of, uh, you know, race-centric race -centric, uh, baggage. And to do that, we have to think at a scale bigger than America. Um, I don't think that it is necessarily the job of North America or Europe to lead us to the promised land, right? Um, We've got to get there together, really. So, so when you say, what will it all look like? Um, what I could say is, you know, if you think, imagine how different America is from Europe and North America and Africa of the year 1500. Um, the future we're going to go to will be as different as well. But we really, I think, have sort of two main directions of travel. Either we evolve in towards a direction that is of greater equality and greater acceptance, which will almost necessarily involve all kinds of new mixings, which are, which are scary for people, obviously. Um, or we choose to try to cling to these differentiated groups um, to not allow that, that notion of equality to really go much further. Um, and then, as our technology evolves and it becomes easier and easier and easier to obliterate the entire species, you know, we are going to face enormous risks. Um, right now, we have countries with nuclear weapons, but what happens when a very smart person can genetically engineer a virus that's going to wipe us all out? You know, w w what will we do at that point uh, if we haven't evolved some common way of tackling this? You know, the, the arrival of global warming, the arrival of, of antibiotic you know, resistant infections, these are the beginnings of these things. The things that will come in the future are much more potent, and the response that they will require is much more potent. That potent will be a human response, or it will be no response at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know exactly what it will look like. Uh, I think America is an example, but, you know, uh, but a flawed example, and that hopefully going forward there can be more inclusive and less flawed examples, and that America will be part of that, uh, but won't necessarily lead that. Maybe nobody will lead that. Uh, you know, because maybe we now need to move to a non-led version of, of human beings coming together. Mohsen, a quick uh, f uh, final question. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute. You said at the uh, outset that uh, at a previous uh, talk here you had an epiphany about your work as mm. a result of a question. I sh I'm sure that your talk this evening was epiphanous for many of us. <laughs> many breakthroughs again tonight? Well, I mean, you know, I don't know yet. The difference is none of you have read the book. Uh, so, so, 
so that time what happened was somebody came and told me something about the book um, and and it really made me think about my book differently and and so far uh, I guess you know the book just came out two three days ago maybe some of you have read it but very few um, I'll tell you the story of what happened maybe I can do that yes. so and if, if you're here um, you know please uh, raise your hand and uh, uh, or actually don't, just tell me afterwards. Uh, <laughs> correct my inaccuracies because it's much better the way I'm going to tell this story than what, how it actually happened. Um, so I was here and it was a Russian fundamentalist um, and I was signing books. Perhaps it was a paperback uh, because people had read it. Or maybe I'd come late in my book tour. And a young man waited till the very end. And he was, you know, he was a blonde guy with uh, you know, blonde dreadlocks and a pierced eyebrow and lugs in his ears. And he was holding, you know, he comes up to me and he waits for everybody to sign the book. And he says, you know, to me at the end, he says, dude, this book is about me. I'm sort of looking at his, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was The Rajan Fundamentalist, and, uh, um, you know, which, which is a story of a Pakistani man working in New York <laughs> who grows a beard and moves back to Pakistan after the events of 9-11. And, uh, and I said, you know, how so? <laughs> and, uh, and, he said, and he said, well, you know, I went to this Ivy League school. I did two years in an investment bank in New York, and it just wasn't for me. And I dropped out, and I've become a yoga instructor here in D.C. Oh. And that's the first time I realized, you know, that he was, he was correct. It was the first time I realized that whatever I had imagined the Rutten Fundamentalist was, it really, at its heart, was a story of an idealistic liberal arts graduate who goes and works in the corporate world and is disillusioned by it. <laughs> and, and, you know, and of course that's what the book was. But, but I had thought so many other things that that basic, simple essence of it had eluded me till he said it. And, and, I, and I bring that up in part because, you know, this is when we say, oh, well, you know, the civilization or you're American or whatever. Um, if this guy, uh, who's not from Pakistan, maybe he's never even been to Pakistan, can imagine that this novel is about him, then our definition of you know, what is me and what is him and what these cultures are is, is deeply you know, suspect. And so he was a reminder when people asked me in Pakistan, how do Americans respond to your book? And I say, look, there's 300 million different Americans, and each American responds differently to everything. And, and the same with Pakistan. There's 200 million different Pakistanis. They don't read the same way. You know, it's not sort of like the Pakistanis are you know, the Mac operating system and Americans are <laughs> PC. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's uh, and, and this story uh, I like to tell just because it's a reminder that, you know, if the reluctant fundamentalist was about him, um, then any preconceptions that I might have had about, you know, who he was, uh, who I am, based on the groups we appear to belong to, um, those preconceptions really need to be uh, questioned. Thank you. Thank you.